Hello everybody, Dr. F. Scott Field here, and I'd like to introduce you to our newest sponsor. The NPTE Final Frontier is the review course that I wish was around when I took the board exam. For those of you who know my story, it took me a handful of times to pass that exam, and quite frankly, I really wish I had an, a, an exam review course around, uh, just like the NPTE Final Frontier. Uh, check out their website, npteff.com, and use the code HET at checkout for 10% off to all of our listeners and fans. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. F. Scott Feel, and uh, we've got with us again another one of my role models, my heroes, and new co-host to the HET Podcast. So I'm super excited, Dr. Lisa Van Hoos. Dr. Van Hoos, thanks so much for coming on and for being a part of this. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm really excited to talk to you today and also about the future podcast that we're going to be doing Um, I love how you've changed the configuration with having, you know, multiple um, hosts and it's just going to be a good year for the, for the podcast. Yeah. I keep saying that I've assembled an academic Avengers and I'm proud of it. You know, Uh, like I said, I get to work with my heroes now. So I'm like a fanboy. you know, this is pretty fun for me. Um, And that's pretty funny because that's how we feel about you. We're (laughs) going to learn at the feet of the podcast Jedi. Yeah, we're going to we're going to share some things. We're going to go back and forth. It's a two way street, right? If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. So come on. (laughs) Well, Lisa, tell us a little bit about your academic journey and how it's led you to where you're at today. Um, So I have said this in many public spaces that I was not one of those students that was like, I knew I wanted to be a PT. Um, PT actually found me. I was in college. Um, planning on getting an information systems degree, right? I was going to be a computer person um, in a cubicle somewhere, not really having to deal with humans. And um, the university that I was at wanted to diversify their PT program. And so that was what began my journey. And so then I went to the University of Central Arkansas. I graduated in 1996. Benita Lovelace Chandler was my department chair. That tells you a little bit about where I'm at in regards yeah. to the, the decades. Um, but then I practiced for a while. I practiced for about 10 years and then went back to education um, to work on a PhD at the University of Kansas. And that's actually where I entered the academy and became a faculty member. And so I was working on my PhD while I was being a full-time faculty member at KU. And then after that, I worked on a master's in public health and I've done, you know, a postdoc experience and a couple of fellowships in um, geriatrics and also cardiovascular genetic epidemiology. But I am of the belief that you have to be a lifelong learner, right? Even if it's not formal education, you just have to continue to learn, especially in healthcare, um, because the information is just turning over so quickly. You got to stay on top of it. Yeah, that couldn't be more true. And I think, you know, realistically, we're finding now that like, even if it's not healthcare related, but you're learning other skill sets or other, you know, you're borrowing your, I I like to call it intellectual trespassing, right, from other fields, other professions, Mm -hmm. that stuff is just helpful for life in general, not just your, your job or your profession, you know, it's just helpful for you as a person and growth. I so agree, because I mean, like in this digital age, Um, Each of us has our own ecosystem, right? So there are hundreds of people that are working behind the scenes just so you can have Scott's life or Lisa's life. And so the things that we learn in our workplace, although they may feel like they're very occupational centered or, you know, career centered, most of those things are going to translate over because that digital world is just, it's just overlapping more and more in what we do. And so that was one of the things that I learned early on was um, I was listening to a TED talk and this gentleman was talking about how it takes about two to 300 different disciplines to get someone through an episode of care. So even though that patient or that student may just see the educator or the therapist in front of them, behind the scenes, there's a whole plethora of people that are also working. And so there's just so much to learn. Yeah, the more you know, I mean, it's it's literally uh, 
G.I. Joe, right? A, a real American hero. Now yeah. you know, and knowing is half the battle. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where, again, I, I the reason I ended up with an EDD was because I am a lifelong learner and I'm curious and I'm always wanting to know. I didn't think I was going to teach. Truth be told, I was going to get that EDD and just wait till retirement. Nah, maybe I'll teach a class or two. It'll be nice to have that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, things kind of changed. COVID hit. You know, we took a left turn at Albuquerque and here I am at uh, academia now. So, you know, uh, worked out though, seems to be working. Okay. Um, no. And we're well, glad to have you because there's a significant <laughs> faculty shortage. Yeah. Um, and I think for us as a profession, the thing we've got to think about is this 50, 50 CAPTI rule. Yeah. And it is actually, that may be the, our biggest barrier to being able to have qualified faculty members in our program. Yeah, I mean, we I just talked about this the other day uh, with uh, with a guest. I can't remember who it was, but regardless, the, the moral of the story is we get a doctoral degree, but then that doctoral degree is not good enough, quote unquote, to teach at the same program that you just got the doctoral degree from, right? A clinical DPT is not, you know, it's not enough. It seems arbitrary, right, to have 50% have terminal degrees, uh, but even bigger problem is we're about to lose a huge wave of retirees, right? There's people who've been doing it for a really long time that are really just pinnacles and, and you know, cornerstones of the profession. And they're about to retire. So I feel like they, this is just personal, you know, opinion. I feel like there's going to be a little bit of a mass exodus coming up in the next couple of years and there's going to be a void. So how do we address that? I don't know. Well, I think the first thing is, is, you know, like you said, when you ask people, where did that number come from? 50%, it really, somebody just pulled it out the air. I mean, yeah. there is no evidence. It's not, you know, research has not been investigated. And so in a profession that is, you know, constantly saying evidence-based, evidence-informed, that's one thing right there that we need to say, you know what, until yeah. we have something that justifies that, scientifically justifies that, then we need to just remove that from our accrediting standards and elements. The second thing to me is the fact of that when we are saying as a profession that the DPT is not enough, you can't be mad when other disciplines say that we're not enough. Right. You can't be mad when we have tiered reimbursement or when you feel like we're not being reimbursed enough because we set that message out there, right? That we were inadequate. Um, you can't be mad when people don't invite us to tables where they're having, you know, conversations about the next wave of healthcare. We said that DPTs weren't enough, right? You can't be mad when we look at research funding and we're like, there's not enough DPT funding. Well, we said the DPT wasn't enough. So some of this is just the energy you put out is the energy you get. So I really think CAPTI needs to just you know, for a season, maybe for yeah. three to five years, just say, okay, we're not going to enforce that standard and then let programs be innovative and see what happens to the quality of instruction. And I yeah. guarantee you it ain't going to change. Well, not only that, right? I've had PhD professors who were terrible teachers, like great researchers, amazing clinicians, couldn't teach worth a lick though, right? So, so a PhD who's never been taught how to teach doesn't necessarily know how to transfer the knowledge, right? Whereas an EDD, and again, I'm not picking on PhD versus EDD here, but an EDD who may learn the techniques, the methods, the theory behind teaching and how to teach and how to transfer knowledge may end up being able to teach a little bit better, which is nice, but then they may not have the clinical skills if they went right from like, let's say PT school to an EDD program, right? So it has to balance out a little bit there too. You got to find a good, a good fit, but I've seen just DPT, uh, professors who were clinical for 10, 15 years and are amazing teachers. Yeah. So, no, I, I, and I think that kind of comes back to the fact that, that, you know, like who is that DPT? Um, what self work have they done in regards to pedagogy and andragogy? Um, but I do agree that because those of us that have PhDs and PhDs that aren't in education, because there are a few people who have PhDs in education. Um, we are trained with a different mindset. So one of the things I remember very early on when I had a K award, so I'm, so I'm done with my PhD. So now I'm applying for, you know, 
grants to help train me in other content areas, y'all. So I planned this project and the mentor was like, this project is focused too much on the people. And I'm like, but I'm a therapist, right? You know, yes, I have a PhD, but ultimately I'm a therapist. I'm concerned with outcomes at an individual level. And this person looked me in the eye and said, research is not about people. Research is about process. And the quicker you get that, the more successful you are going to be. And so when we take PhDs that have been trained from that mindset, it's hard for us to think about learner-centered care because that's what education is, is learner-centered care. It's all about caring for somebody because that person's concerned about the process. That's how we've been trained, right? Can I create a process that almost looks like a factory line? I'm doing the same thing over and over again. So that way I can assess the outcomes and not go, oh, the conditions change. But really good education, the conditions should slightly change because every learner is different. And so we do, we need educators that understand how to be adaptive master teachers. Um, and PhDs may not be the best person for that. Yeah, especially in something like human and life sciences, you know, like when you're coming from a, a field that is so human centric, it's got to be a little bit of give and take, you know? Yeah. I well, mean, Lisa, not let's... unless you're looking at people like, you know, social scientists and anthropologists. Right, right. Um, yeah. Let's uh, let's look at the nuts and bolts of today's episode here. I'm, I'm excited to hear about your areas of interest and what you look forward to talking about on the show over the next uh, several months, weeks, years, days, whatever. Y'all heard that, didn't you? You heard him say <laughs> weeks, years. I heard that. I heard him slip. I, heard I, him slip I, I, I put them all in there. I put them all in there. Yes. So basically, you know, the focus is, is healthcare um, education transformation. And for me right now, what brings me passion is this concept of social reconstructionism education, that what is going on in the world should be transforming the education because ultimately you are going to be the practitioner that's going to have to deal with those social issues. And so the segments that we're gonna be running are primarily going to be looking at individuals um, in PT and other areas that are out in the community, helping students to learn that your education, your practice area goes beyond the clinic. And that sometimes the community as a classroom may be the best place for you to learn and to be able to apply and then also learn how to adapt because you've got to work with these humans that are going to be constantly dynamic. And so I'm really looking forward to, um, we're going to call our segment the Ujima segment, right? So how are you out in the community collectively working and being responsible for the practitioners of tomorrow? Yeah, I love that. I obviously my you know, dissertation was on service-based learning. So I love getting out in the community and teaching and educating because I feel like that's a much better fit, especially for physical therapy, right? Experiential learning to me is is how I learned. That's why I felt it was such a good tool. But at the time of my dissertation, only 50% of the uh, DPT schools in the nation were using service-based learning. And so I kind of thought, well, why is that? Why aren't we all using it, you know? Right. Uh, and so- I don't know. I think it's a great tool. I think we need to do more of it. I think, you know, the community is where a lot of our learning should happen. Maybe not for all types of, of you know, uh, majors and disciplines, but for physical therapy, it seems to be a really good fit. Healthcare in general, any of those, it's probably yeah, a good fit. It totally makes sense. And as we're starting to have, you know, more conversations about value-based reimbursement and also about, you know, where shared decision-making is becoming mandatory, it's no longer going to be optional. Um, we have to train a different practitioner who is comfortable working with the community, not so much lecturing the community, but comes into these relationships at a power neutral place. And so we're looking forward to talking with people that are actually doing things right now and that they're willing to come on, tell their stories in a vulnerable way. So they're going to tell you what went well. They're going to tell you where they jacked up and messed up because that's part of the human condition. Um, so that we can all learn from each other. Because one of the things we often do in healthcare education is we just work in our silos. Like, and it's not just even dis disciplinary. It's also like programmatic. Like, I'm just going to, you know, we're not going to share what we're doing over here at this university. And it's just wasting resources. 
Um, Because the quicker we can learn from each other, the quicker we can attenuate some of these health disparities that we see. Yeah, I feel like a broken record. We've been saying this a lot the last several months, but a rising tide raises all ships, right? I mean, like we should all be sharing this knowledge and wealth. And like, that's why the podcast started, right? Was to break down silos, not just in amongst DPT programs, but amongst all the healthcare. Like, what are the nurses learning? How are they learning it? Okay, can we grab some of that? Like, oh, that doesn't look good. And then dentists are doing this and that doesn't seem to be working. Let's stay away from that, you know? Like right. we're trying to find best practices here for, for all of healthcare and humanity, right? It's not uh, it's not just uh, for physical therapy. So I think that that was one of the things that, that really started this podcast and really got things going is how can we break down those silos? And, uh, you know, luckily we've had some really great people thus far and uh, plan to keep it going. So we'll, with the help of the new co-hosts and stuff, we're, we're looking forward to... Uh, more continued success. Oh, it's going to be good. And y'all know, I, I like a little mix it up, disruption, provocative. So we're, we're going to go in on some of these segments and ask some of the tough questions, but it's going to be fun though. I love it. I love it. Well, Lisa, we're, we're, we ask all the guests this final question. You'll get used to asking this one as well. If you could change one aspect of higher education, whether it be DPT or otherwise, what aspect would you change? Why would you change it? And how would you change it? Um, I'm going to stay in my lane. And so I'm going to talk about PT education. Um, One thing that I would change is I think every program should have to take transfer students. And here's my rationale. Because it is unrealistic for a student, for an applicant, to be able to understand the culture and climate of 300 something programs. But that is the burden that we have put upon these applicants. And then they get into a program, they recognize it's not a good academic cultural fit for them, and there's no place for them to go. So that would be like you being in a relationship with somebody that you like, oh, this is bad. I need to get out of this tomorrow. And somebody saying you can't get out. And so why could we not have programs that would allow students to transfer into their programs? Um, Even if it's not all the programs. Could we identify maybe 25% of our programs that would allow for you to transfer and somehow incentivize them to do it? Um, the other reason behind that is because the last number I think I heard was 70% of the attrition rate. So students that are dismissed from PT programs are black and brown students. That makes absolutely no sense to me when you do the math because they don't represent 70% of the students that are in programs. So yes, some of that may be individual issues, but what it really tells me when you see disparities like that, that's a systems issue, that's a structural issue. And so those students, the just thing would be is would be to allow them to find a program that can meet their needs and welcome them and be inclusive to them. Um, So, Ideally, 25% of our programs would take transfer students. If y'all not ready for that, then just tell me how I can start a transfer program. So I've asked a few people, they give me the deer in the headlight look like they don't know what I'm talking about. But in my mind, could we have a university, an established program that would allow us to set up an extension? And that extension is for no other reason then students who have been dismissed or students that find themselves in a program that is traumatic because it does not align with their values, you could send us your transcript. We would do a transcript analysis. We would figure out a plan of study for you using the established curriculum of that CAPTI accredited program. And we would get you to a degree. So when people are like, oh, we need to diversify and it's gonna take forever. I'm like, you lie. If we could figure out a way to transfer students into other programs, we could quickly change the diversity of the workforce. That That's what I would do. Yeah, it's an interesting answer. We have not had that one yet. That's uh, That's not something I had considered. But if you think about it, let's start at the end goal. We all take one NPTE exam. It's all the same across the nation, state to state. So it's dumb for us to even have, quote unquote, state licenses. I kind of get it. Like, protection and all but if we all pass the exact same board exam you know doesn't make sense there so if the goal of all the pt programs what 200 and 
70 or so. I don't yeah. know where we're at now. It's getting up there close to 300. Mm -hmm. uh, if the goal of all those programs is to get us safe practitioners that pass the board exam, then there should be some out of those almost 300 that, that do align enough to where there's some interchangeability for sure. No, well, most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. So, and at the end of the day, if we're all, you know, most of us are using the same clinical education, you know, measure. So we're all teaching students the same thing. Right. So it's just a matter of figuring out where the courses map up against each other. And yeah, you might have to come up with an independent study course to fill the yeah, gap. fill gaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're making this way more difficult than it has to be. Right. It, um, it's it, Plus, even let's go back further. When they apply to get into PT school, there's now a generic application that gets you into most PT programs. Maybe not all. I, I'm not exactly sure on the statistics on that, but they they fill out the, what is it, the P, PT cast? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, again... If we're filling out the same thing to get into these same programs to finish the same board exam, there should be, you know, a little bit more. It seems a little bit egocentric to be like, oh, well, the way that we do it is the the, the special sauce. And that's what makes the difference. And so the way we do, it's the best. And you can't come into this program because you didn't know our way. You did a different way. Like, you know, seems a bit ridiculous. It seems a lot ridiculous. So because we've got that foolishness on that side of it. And then if we're going to talk about PT PTCAS, there's no reason why we have programs that do not have a full cohort. When we have X amount of applicants coming through the pipeline, we have a group of them that never get accepted into a program. Why could we not every quarter? Because all of this is coded, right? Because for those of you who've worked in PT Cash, you know, we go in there and we place labels on students, right? So we place a label that says that they've been accepted, that kind of thing. So then why could a student not opt in and say, look, I waive my right to privacy. And if after this quarter, I've not been accepted into a PT program, put my name on a spreadsheet, send that spreadsheet out to programs, and that way they know that I'm interested in being recruited to their programs. Yeah. But there's no reason why some programs have, you know, 10, five seats left yeah. and we've got students trying to get in. Exactly. It would almost be like uh, matching for med school, mm -hmm. you know, like, hey, here, here's our pool. Do you match up? Great. Come on board, you know? Right. Yeah. Because this concept that, you know, we have to recognize the fact of what they're paying 150 something dollars 155, somewhere around there, then, you know, they've got an additional fee, which is much lower for every additional school. Yeah. But we're hearing students talk about, you know, they're spending $1,000 to, to apply to multiple schools to try to increase their odds. Yeah. My thing is, is let the system do what it does, right? So I'm not saying take money away from CAPT, but if a student has paid and they're still in the queue, let students try use the system to match students up. Yeah. Right. Or at least let programs know that, hey, these students are out here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Lisa, where can people reach out to you and follow up if, if they have more questions or just want to know what you're up to these days? Oh, so I mean, so first thing is, is, you know, if you want to reach out to me at my academic job. Um, so I am a clinical professor at Baylor University. So Baylor DPT. Um, so I participate in the Baylor hybrid program. Um, many people also know me from the Ujima Institute and the Ujima Center. So you can just go to www.theujima, that's U-J-I-M-A, center.org. And you can find us there as well. And you can learn about what's going on at the community center um, here in Monroe, Louisiana. Awesome. We'll drop all those links in the show notes and look forward to hearing you on the episodes. Thank you so much. Have a, have a good time, everybody.